All right, welcome everybody. This is our teaching and learning call for um, October 21st. Can you believe it? It's already that late in the year. Um, so I'm Wilma Hodges. I'll be facilitating today. And um, on today's agenda, we have um, Marty Supkoff from Duke. He's going to show us a little bit about um, some features in Moodle that we might want to use for inspiration on ways that we might want to improve um, things in Sakai. So that should be fun to do a little competitive analysis there. Um, but before we get going, we will um, start off with announcements. Uh, so just a reminder for anyone who hasn't already um, registered, please um, think about registering for the virtual conference. The registration is super cheap this year. It's only $5, so it's quite affordable. Um, we know people are strapped for professional development money, so we try to make it as reasonable as possible, but still, um, you know, get people to have a little skin in the game. So um, the rest of the registration fees are being generously um, sponsored by Longsite and Learning Experiences, so you have them to thank for those reduced rates. Um, and we've got a really great program. We've got a whole bunch of lightning talks we're going to be doing in the afternoon. There's a featured session for um, from LAMP. The LAMP webinar on social engagement in the age of social distancing is going to be in the afternoon. Um, Dr. Chuck and um, Laura Gibbs um, are doing a keynote and uh, and that's going to be kind of a, um, what was the title? Um, Pedagogy and Privacy in a Pandemic, I believe was the title. But it's going to be sort of an interactive chat session um, with a recorded presentation, but Dr. Chuck will be in the chat um, answering questions, and then there'll be some live Q&A um, for that as well. So uh, it's going to be a great program, so I encourage you guys to sign up. And um, we do actually have a networking um, slash fun activity before and after the main conference presentations, we're going to be running um, online escape rooms. So you can join a little bit early that day to do one in the morning before the sessions begin, or you can hang around after the wrap up um, to do one in the um, early evening. So there'll be two different times where you can join one of those online escape rooms. So that should be a fun um, thing for folks. And, and we Wilma, also, you, you, you buried the lead about the Instagram contest. Yeah, sorry. I was kind of going down the list there. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we do have an Instagram contest happening this year. So we are encouraging folks. And the, the announcement about that just went out um, earlier this week. Um, and we've also been posting about it, I believe. Have we posted about it yet? I don't know if that, that has gone out on Instagram. But um if you go to the link in the chat in the chat um, or in the etherpad i can put it in the chat as well that gives you all the details on the contest but essentially we want folks to post pictures of them and their sagai gear whether that's you know this year's gear once you receive it or um, Sakai paraphernalia from a previous event. Uh, so, you know, even anything with the Sakai logo or the Sakai Gur, um, just to kind of show your, you know, pride in, in the LMS. And we're going to be looking at the ones that have the most likes and voting on the, um, the top one from that, the ones with the most likes during the event. So, um, so that'll be another new thing that we're doing this year. So I encourage you guys to post some photos of you with your Sakai gear and, you know, be creative. You can also do video too, but it has to be 30 seconds or less. Um, so, all right, so enough about the conference. Um, any other announcements that people would like to make right now? OK, so I'm going to turn it over to Marty. And Marty, do you want um, screen share? Yes, please. All right, so you should be presenter now. You should be able to share your screen. You guys see it? Oh, yes. You guys see the uh, windows going yep. crazy. The infinite big blue button. Here. Okay, awesome. So I haven't used big blue button for screen sharing, but we'll see how this goes. Um, so kind of give a background about myself. Um, I came from two different universities that were using Moodle. So coming to Duke and seeing Sakai was a little bit different. 
Um, so I like to kind of compare and contrast between the two UIs and UXs to kind of see where one may do better, or one may do worse. Um, so, and also some background on how I'm doing this. I'm using a Moodle demo site that they have up and it actually resets on the hour. Um, the good part about that is you can continue to play with things. The bad part about that is it's open to anyone. So I'm actually doing everything live right now. And as you can see, it looks like someone in Russia or somewhere has also used the site. So hopefully they don't delete what I have created thus far. Um, in case anybody wants it, the URL is up there as well. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to kind of show that Moodle does um, is a little bit more consistent around drag and drop stuff. Um, and if you haven't used Moodle before, uh, it's a little bit different in its orientation as well of where all the content kind of goes down the middle of the, the page where you've got topics or you can name these weeks um, versus Sakai doing everything kind of a little bit more tool based in the sidebar of all your resources in one spot, all your tests and quizzes in one spot. They do it where you break it out kind of by week. Um, so to kind of give an example of how like their drag and drop works a little, uh, if I actually turn editing on, um, I can now add stuff to the course page and let me go ahead and move this over. I've got some test files over here. I can actually click and drag and now add this to whichever week I want. If I want to move it down in a week, I can drag it uh, to a different topic. Um, and this kind of consistent drag and drop also shows up if you add different types of activities or resources. So say I was at, able to add an assignment here and I just say assignment, I can kind of drag that and drop it into the box there as well. Um, I'll go ahead and save that and return to the course. Um, where Sakai kind of does it, they only really have it right now where that's kind of in the resources where you kind of get that drag and drop. Um, there may be a couple other places, but at least with Sakai, it's you have to come in, select the folder, select upload before you get to this uh, drag and drop resource um, kind of option. Um, so it, it's a couple more steps um, to get it going like that. Then also having that consistent interface of where you can do it in all the assignments. And this is kind of another kind of trait with Moodle is all their tools kind of have the same interface for creation. So uh, as you saw when I was creating the assignments, if I was to create a form instead, you get the same first name uh, option, then description, then it goes into the specific settings for that tool. So an instructor that's coming from, say, heavily using assignments and they want to try out forms, they at least have some uh, knowledge of how they're going to set this up. They can kind of see it, the bare bones of it. Um, the next option I have here, and I kind of want to get to this one before someone deletes this quiz here, um, goes around uh, pagination. So with Sakai, with pagination, you get three different options. I believe I have a test one set up here. Of where you can separate it out by question. Um, so if you have a long quiz, that's not a great experience for students because they're 100 questions loading 100 pages is not ideal. They're just going to lose a lot of time. You have each part, which is better, um, but it really depends on how many questions you have per part. Uh, so we have some instructors that uh, create many different varieties of the same question. Um, so when they go and add a part and randomly pull from a question pool, what essentially happens is that each part ends up being one question. So it kind of does the same behavior as uh, the single question per page. And then the last option being the complete assessment displayed on the one web page. That's great for shorter quizzes, but again, with longer quizzes, that's not great because students may not see the save button down at the bottom. There is the auto save if your university does have that set up that should save stuff as it goes. Um, but if they have a bad internet connection or something else, they can lose questions or data without knowing it because they haven't loaded a new page. The way Moodle does it is they have it within the settings itself. Uh, it looks like someone's taking my quiz. Um, and I actually set this up. Maybe I should show that first. I set this up with th just three questions here. And within the settings, you can select by default. As an admin, I can select what would show up in this box, but I can select to do a new page every question. No uh, questions all on one page, but then also you get the option to separate it out by numbers here as well. 
Um, so say, for example, I wanted to do it every two questions, I then, if I save this, it will actually repaginate this. And if I go and look at the questions again, you'll see the first page is two now, and the third question ends up on its own page. Um, and if you want, you can actually go, and it looks like someone's attempting this, so I can't change the order now. Uh, but you're, if no one has attempted the quiz, you can actually set the defaults to do number of questions per page. So at my former university, I believe we did 10 questions, um, and instructors could change from there. Uh, but say I, the 10 questions were put in place for like 50 questions, but then one instructor wanted to move questions together. Again, the drag and drop consistency, I could actually drag these questions into a new page. So maybe one page will have 11 questions because those 11 questions should be uh, put together. Um, so that flexibility makes it a little easier. And in addition, if you do have question pools, you can actually mix the question pool uh, questions together. Um, so if you have one pool uh, pulling five questions and another pool in six questions, you could actually have them all show up on a single page versus the way Sakai is doing it right now is if you're pulling from a uh, random question pool, that's kind of its own self-contained part. Um, let me see, check my notes real quick, see if I have anything else on that. Are there any questions yet? I'm going fairly quickly, I think. We had a few things in the chat early on about uh, drag and drop accessibility. I don't know if you could speak to that. Uh, so, yes, so the way it works for that, um, at least I can speak a little bit. Uh, the drag and drop like onto the test page, I can't, I don't think there's any way to really get around that. But what you can do, um, at least for their accessibility here, is with this drag and drop here, if I actually click on this, I can actually then, this menu will pop up, and I can tab through where I want it to go, and then hit enter, and it will move. So let me try that again, clicking, or if I was selecting that, say I was putting this down at the bottom, it will move down like that. that answer that question? I think that was Tiffany's question. So, Let's see if she adds anything. If you still dra have to drag and drop to get the resources onto the page in the first place, how does somebody who's using a keyboard or screen reader do that? They can't. I mean, so they won't. They won't be able to do that exact drag and drop, but they can use the kind of old-fashioned adding the activity. And there's a oh, okay. There. Okay, that's good. <laughs> So the drag and drop is kind of just a shortcut in that sense. Right. I mean, I'm I'm just concerned if there's no other method uh, for those users to access that, uh, you know, yeah. the so, interface yeah. and be able to do that. So, Marty, for the when you're mixing questions from different pools, can so that means it can totally randomize the whole test over multiple pools. Correct. Yeah. That's something that that we've had instructors asking about. That's like, is there any way, you know, they're doing multiple draws from multiple pools, but they want the whole thing to be randomized and, and they can't do that. Yeah, so if I do, I'm going to delete the selected attempt so I can re-edit this quiz again. There is a shuffle here that I could select and it will mix up all of the questions in here. Mm. And then at the question level, uh, you actually select whether you want the choices. You can select here if you want to shuffle the choices. And so that's kind of the first check. But then with the quiz options itself, you can also then select if you want to um, randomize the choices, I believe it's called. Or, you know, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Oh, within questions, yeah. Let me move the Imperial window to another one so I can see some of the chat just in case. All right, so the next item, um, oh, I wish I hadn't deleted that now, uh, is around the saving or viewing of logs for if there is a quiz. So I'm going to pull up a second window here. Um, and this window is actually logged in as a student in the same site. So let me go ahead and quickly take this quiz. and jump back over here. When you're reviewing the attempt, um, you can actually see when the student started the question or when they got there. So this would be when they arrived on the page, 
when they saved and then when it was actually uh, graded or submitted. Um, so right now we've had a lot of students that have lost data and with the auto save going off or if they navigate away or even just save, we can't tell exactly when they save to see when they stop to maybe potentially go to another page. So by having this logging history here, it made it a little easier to go and check, okay, this student got to question number three um, and then they stopped because we no longer see any saves here. And we can actually go back and see when they um, kind of finish there. So let me see if I set this up here. So if I take this one again, there was a come in here, answer some questions, go to back, maybe change these again. The one thing is here, since I'm doing this so quickly, is they're all going to have the same timestamp uh, by the minute. Now you can see where they've changed their answers on a student by student basis. Or excuse me, attempt by attempt basis. Marty, what, what triggers that? that to show a save is it as soon as they click any answer or do they have to do something else to to trigger the save so it's similar it's, to at least the Kai without the save button it's the movement between pages okay so okay. it's gonna so it's gonna save questions one and two at the same time when you click next page correct it will save okay. everything that's on that page so they okay. do have a mode that's kind of replicates Sakai's where it has that save button down at the uh, bottom or per question, but that's more of kind of a self-paced of just get the quite, we really want you to get the question right. Um, so we don't really care about how many times you guess it. So you can actually save on a per question basis. This is just the default method of um, moving through a quiz where it's just go through it, answer it, submit, get a score at the end versus kind of immediate feedback. Okay. Um, any other questions on that? Let me jump over to the chat in the other window. Uh, Laura says, showing what time and answered. That's nice. Do, do, do. Uh, Dave, I can't talk about the session handling. Um, I'm not a dev, so this is more just front end stuff. Uh, looks like Tiffany's on that. So I'm going to jump to the next thing. Um, and this is similar to kind of the save here. Um, but what Moodle has for pretty much every page, um, if you try to leave, say you start entering some content and then I try to leave, you get a pop up warning. And it uses, I believe, what is a browser default of you have data here that is unsaved. So the message will be slightly different across different browsers but it will essentially say changes you have made have not been saved. So what this would kind of cut out on is at least with Sakai, if they have some stuff answered and they clicked like a new window or they clicked to go away, it wouldn't affect them. It's with this message being there for any time you've entered data, you then it's a buffer. Um, if I started creating a activity here, entered some data, and then try to go away, I get that warning. Um, so I think that would be a big thing so that students know if they try to leave without hitting the save button, they won't lose that data. Our instructors as well as going to any page. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to jump over to the chat. I moved fairly quickly here, I know. Again, I wanted to make sure no one in Russia deleted what I had set up. Uh, Tiffany, was that a, the also law? Events logged in the system logs, are you referring to within Moodle or within Sakai? 
I, I'm referring to within Sakai. So there, there are actually events for page navigation. Um, they're very hard to read in the system logs for a non-dev, because I'm a non-dev, um, but they are there. Uh, and Sorry, go ahead. what? Go ahead. I mean, they, the events are there, but they're not surfaced in any easily readable way, not even to, you know, support staff. Um, there's also a set of events that are associated with um, timer, timed quiz. Mm -hmm. So if a student is in a timed quiz, every few seconds, the logs are spammed with the browser timer request. And you can sort of watch these going in the logs and, and see uh, all of the browser timer requests. You can tell if a, if a student is in a time test, if they stop being in it, because the, the browser request will be gone. Are you talking, is it the logs that say like presence begin, present end with like, that's essentially all it says? I do yeah, see it's those. similar to those logs, but I mean, that's part of the logs, those, um, those presence things that are not uh, useful. But, <laughs> um, but, but this is among those, there's a set of, of logs in the more detailed logs uh, that, are, that are not surfaced, I think, to um, to some uh, support staff, you know, depending on who your service provider is, if you're using a service provider for Sakai, um, I think that some of this detail is not sur necessarily surfaced to everyone. But um, there are events that are happening in the logs um, that are the timer. So I don't know if, if you're... Um, Dave, when you when you mention the timer log entry submit, um, it's not a submit event being surfaced to the instructor. The timer entries um, are request. There's a there's a word for it. I can look up the the information if you want me to. Um, I just don't remember what the event is is called. But there is an event that is associated with the browser requesting the time remaining from the server. And it, it spams the logs when a student's in a time test. And so if that just stops like halfway through the test, then you know that the student's not in it anymore because they've just closed that browser window <laughs> or their internet has cut off. Um, yeah, so there, there's also those ones, Dave. There will be a different one for if it's timer submitted, if it's uh, student submitted, uh, different ones for that. So I, I believe what Tiffany's talking about is different logs for it's always checking to see if someone's still around. It, it's not checking to see if they're around. The browser has to ask the server how much time remains in a time test. So this was something that um, that David Hutchins at UVA developed, uh, redid the timer uh, workings. And um, when that was done, the timers used to be partly server side and partly user side. And now they're entirely server side. So the UI JavaScript display of the timer bar to students um, counts down and asks the server how much time remains every few seconds. OK. So do you know what version it was? And then I'll jump back, Sean. I long. think it went in like 12 or 20, something like that. Okay. So it could be worried some of us don't have that yet. So kind of on that log approach there, another thing that Moodle does is it surfaces some of these logs a little bit more up front for instructors. Um, so if I actually go over um, on, a, on an activity or resource basis, I can actually see the logs here to see who's done what at which time. And it does use terms that are a little bit more, um, we'll say, upfront and readable for an end user. Uh, so here you can see where an attempt was reviewed, a report was viewed, it was submitted, um, where they get to the last page as they continue as well. So like you can actually, with these logs, um, you can filter down by students. So what some instructors do with this is uh, you can do this at the course level. Um, or you can do it by here where I select a specific activity or resource. Um, you can select a specific student. You can select a specific action. Uh, sources and events 
don't use that too much, but say if I wanted to see just the logs for a student here on quiz one, I can get just that. And what some instructors ended up doing with this information, they would go through and review this. Um, if they had an uh, office hours uh, appointment with someone to see if the student struggling, have they actually gone through and done certain things. So if the student says they're doing poorly in a certain, um, they've done poorly on quizzes, you can actually go and say, well, this quiz went over this information and that was in the, all the information was in this file or PowerPoint that I uploaded. Let me go see if this student actually accessed that PowerPoint. Nothing to display. This student never accessed this. No wonder they did so poorly on the quiz. Maybe they should go and review that and you can let them know. Um, the downside of this is there are some instructors that go down the rabbit hole really, really deep. Um, we've had some instructors in the past that they were actually checking every single resource for every student and students had access a certain resource two or three times in order to get a participation grade. And that's just bad pedagogy because what students can do is they can just click on the PowerPoint three times and it will report a log three times of them accessing it. Uh, so it seems like it's, it's got some good to their logs, but then it also it depends uh, kind of coaching instructors on how to use this properly. Um, and that's about it I had on the agenda. I didn't want to pack stuff too full, but I know I went through things pretty quickly. So kind of just to rehash um, some of the things I went over was using a kind of a consistent drag and drop going into certain resources. Um, so as I mentioned, at least with Sakai, you've got to do that additional step, at least for the resources tool, uh, going to resources for selecting the action versus Potentially, if we could drag and drop here, which I actually haven't tried, but I'm assuming what it's going to do is it's just going to try to read this file in the browser. Oh, it redownloaded it for me. Okay, awesome. Um, so that doesn't work. Uh, the quiz settings, kind of some flexibility around being able to repaginate things um, that would allow being able to um, kind of mix up question pools in a random order. Um, so that way the question pool doesn't just have to be its own part. Um, the instructor view, being able to see uh, logs of when uh, student uh, answered certain questions. Um, so that way you can kind of backtrack where they started to go wrong. Um, it looks like our Russian counterpart is taking this quiz again. Um, the uh, leave warning. So if you've entered data on a page, if that data has not been saved, it warns you that you're about to leave and lose said data. And again, I'm pretty sure that's uh, browser set. I don't know exactly what the function is called within each browser, um, but if I was to use Firefox or Safari, I'm pretty sure the message shows up a little bit differently. So I'm just, I don't think it's something that would set how you move on. So data saved and you're leaving the page. Um, and then the consistency amongst the different tools, uh, at least the interfaces for an instructor to create it, um, because coming and creating a quiz is a little bit different than creating an assignment here. Um, so it, uh, you do have these similarities around it needs a name, it needs a description, it has some dates. Uh, but as with the assignment tool here, it's kind of all put together on one page versus within the uh, quizzes. You've got drop down menus within page. Um, some of these, if I want to expand them all here versus the assignment doesn't have any of these kind of subsections or um, pop outs uh, and thus it doesn't have this expand ball. Uh, page over there. Uh, and then the last one was kind of thrown in there as the logging to see, you know, what students have done a little bit more upfront for the students versus uh, just going to an event log that has like the entry time and the submit time and how long they took. Uh, the Moodle one will show a little bit more detail on how long it took here. If I jump back to all the submissions, uh, showing the grading here, whether they got it right, um, kind of up front, and if they want to dig down a little bit more, they can go into the attempt itself. Any other questions? I believe Tiffany, the yeah, the resources one uh, within the stats. I believe that got a big makeover for Sakai 20 as well. 
Uh, Antonio, uh, at least, so I've been at a Sakai school for about a year now, and I don't think they have that. Uh, it's not heavily asked for, at least when I was at Moodle campuses. Um, every periodically, someone asks about that, and I believe like one person has asked at Duke, uh, but I don't know of any platform or tool that allows uh, a time limit per question. Uh, just thinking initially, that could be quite a interface to kind of come up with of you have to set a time limit per question and then a time limit overall for the quiz. That could be a little bit confusing. Uh, so usually what's done there is to kind of separate that out into a different uh, test. Um, so if you do, usually at least when I've heard of it is instructors want to set like a time limit on an essay question. Of you've got five minutes to type out a paragraph. Um, and usually you can separate those out fairly easy into a different quiz. Yeah. So Dave's reiterating kind of that interface on how that would kind of work out. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Wilma. OK, thanks, everyone. Great. Well, thanks, Marty. That was really good to see um, some of those features in, in Moodle um, that we wish we had or we could do better. <laughs> so it's definitely good um, food for thought there as we look at maybe digging into some of the gnarly workflows and reorganizing um, the user interface in different places. So um, those are definitely some things that we can take away from this and, and apply to those endeavors. Um, one thing I did notice as you were talking about the timestamp, I, I did a little um, exploring in Sakai and actually if you, it's not surfaced very well at all, but if you go to the user activity report in tests and quizzes and click on a, an individual user, um, one of their attempts, and then go to the questions tab in there, if you look at it by question, it'll actually show you the time when they answered each question. So um, it's not as nicely laid out as Moodle, but the data is there. So it would be nice to maybe present that information in a way where the instructor didn't have to dig down into, you know, question by question to, to get the timestamp. Were you looking on trunk or were you looking on um... I'm looking on um, Tricycai, which is running 20. Okay. So, like, I, this, is, this is our local install, and I believe, oops, what did I do? I shared the wrong screen. Let me stop that. Uh, this screen. So, you're saying user activity reports? Yeah. Select, let me see if I've got student here. Like this one, and then going where? Yeah, go, to, go to questions up at the top. Yeah. And then there it tells you oh, okay. so when it's... they answered that question. So you could, if it was like, you know, 50 questions, you could look and see. And you'll, you'll notice that the later questions are at a different minute or, you know, depending how long they took. Okay. Um, oh, so to it, take... it, it, it's actually bringing you back. I don't think you have to go to user activity. I think it's just come to the questions page. I've only got one attempt here and I think it would show uh, if I had more questions going up here it would show all those here and I could just select that and then kind of get that going so yeah but it so it would show I think probably probably save the last save for it I'm assuming um, but not like that if they go and change an answer um, yeah that one it, it it only shows you I think the 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 last save for that question it doesn't show multiple saves yeah and let me see i'm just checking to see if it's making sure it's submitting this time and not like the end submit time for all of them yeah i checked that it, okay. it was a different time the last question obviously will be the same but 
um, earlier questions in the quiz weren't. So yeah, but it's it's kind of hard to get to, and it's a question by question deal. So it's it's sort of annoying to find the information. Um, I think yeah. it could be collected and displayed better. And it would be nice to show, you know, those answer changes, um, which Moodle surfaces that Sakai does not. So I don't know if there's a way. I don't know if that's how that's logged. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Um, so Tiffany, was that a question to Wilma or to me? My instance is we're currently on 19.5. Uh, I was asking what it, um, what version of Sakai that noting each question's timestamp, uh, save timestamp was implemented in. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know it exists in 20. I don't remember if it was there in 19 or not. Um, I could go check on trunk and see if it if it went back to 19. But I'm looking at it right now on a 20 instance, so. It went back at least that far. Uh, and then Dave, so I believe it's on a per question. So if you go into an assessment and then go to the question, sub questions tab, you should then be able to change or select a question to kind of see all the results. Um, I, don't, I don't have a quiz that has a ton of submissions on it, I don't think. Um, yeah. I don't like to show that. Yeah, and you can get to it both ways. The way I did it was through user activity because I was trying to drill down on a student. But you can also just go to the question tab when you're looking at um, the submissions. All right, cool. Um, well, thanks for showing us that, Marty. And um, I discovered something I didn't really know was in Sakai today. So <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> um, right. The questions, at least from previously when I was in Moon School, I wouldn't say instructors use it too much going and drilling down to that, but it was mostly used as by support people when a student calls and saying, I had trouble on this quiz, you can see kind of where they stopped. Um, so right. that's a good permission to know. Right, exactly. All right, well, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, usually, if we have some time left over, we um, talk about some JIRAs that we have in the list. And it looks like we've got three that were in kind of the parking lot from last time. Um, one of them has a note saying that it was a complicated carried over from last time. I don't know if we want to try to dig into that one. It's about attachments. Um, then there's a couple of, or no, there's one about Sam ago, um, modifying the text of the preview banner. And then there's another one about um, assignments in Sam ago, um, the audit log on who edits. So does, and they're all three from Tiffany. Tiffany, do you have a preference or does anybody want to make a case for which one to do first? Well, either of the second two is probably quicker. Okay. Um, so why don't we look at the Samigo one? That is um, SAK43613. And I'll paste that into the chat here. All right. Um, Tiffany, you want to take us through this one? Yeah. So the assessment preview really needs to be redone for accuracy. Uh, we've had a lot of cases where instructors create uh, questions where they embed images. The images are embedded from their uh, home sites, uh, my resources, or the images are embedded from a hidden folder in resources trying to hide them from students, you know, where they actually hide the whole folder and not hidden but allow access to contents. Um, and uh, and so this content show or they embed it from a different site. So like previous semester site, they'll embed a, an image in current semester site or one of those kinds of things to try to keep the images out of the current site uh, and only have students access them in the quiz. Well, the problem with that is students can't actually see them when they take the quiz. But the preview exposes them to the instructor because the instructor is a member of all those sites and has permission to access those images. And the preview does not take into account whether or not the student who is capable of taking this test in the current site 
will be capable of accessing those images. It only cares about the resource access. And this is a huge problem. Um, so really the preview needs to be redone. But uh, at UVA, after we got numerous complaints and, and anger from instructors who had problems with it, um, we expanded the preview warning message because it, it previously just said, assessment preview, this is an example student view of this assessment. So we gave a big long spiel. Um, this preview provides an approximate view of the layout of the assessment for students. The preview will not allow you to save or submit answers, display the timer if there is a time limit, or access any feedback. The preview also does not take into account students' ability or lack thereof to view images or other media embedded in questions. So uh, you know, ultimately the the desire is to make the preview be a real preview or a realer. I should say, preview, um, but uh, this is sort of the, um, the cover yourself uh, stopgap measure that we've implemented. I'm seeing a comment on the JIRA from Sean. Um, do you think a one page, one banner per page only at the top would be enough? Um, currently having the banner twice looks redundant and cluttered, especially on short pages. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's currently at the top and bottom because it also has the exit preview button uh, involved in it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so for a, a user who's a keyboard or screen reader user navigating down a long page, um, it would be very helpful for them to have that button at the bottom. I wouldn't object to having the button dissociated from the message so that the button is placed at the bottom as well as the top, you know, and um, and then have the message just at the top. But it, it would look weird if the button was kind of floating at the top by itself, you know. Um, we had sort of explored that at UVA when we were working on the CSS for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it looked kind of weird. Um, but if there's a way to make it so that the button can be at the bottom as well and, and just have the message at the top, I think that would be fine. Yeah, I think I would prefer to only have the banner once myself. I just think it just adds a lot of visual um, complexity to have it in two places mm -hmm. and more stuff to yep. read. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this or on the language? Looks like Charles is saying only one banner at top. Antonio is saying that the preview should show the same as a real student would see. Yeah, ideally it should. Absolutely. <laughs> and that would be the long-term goal. This is more of a stopgap. And the reason it's an issue is because um, when you're previewing it as the instructor, you still have the ability to access all of the files that are available to you as the instructor, um, whereas a student would only have the folders and files that are available for students to view. So um, they may not have access to the same set of files. Now, some of this could be better handled by making the attachment feature in in the tests work better. So if you actually embed an image in a question pool right now, if the instructor copies that question from the pool to a test, then it um, pulls in the image as an attachment to the test, and then it's internal to the test, which is what I think is a proper behavior, that it should be just internal to the test and not accessible via a resources folder, for example, uh, that is hidden but allows access to contents. Because as soon as a student gets a link out of that folder for an image, they can share it with other students. Um, so, so I think ultimately it would be better if whatever CK Editor does to dump things into content were a drag and drop kind of 
place the image in the editor and it goes in the appropriate content area for that tool and remains hidden when the test is not published kind of thing. Um, so really this is more about content handling, I guess, uh, because I think a lot of these problems could be solved if CK Editor had its own way to save things properly. Um, you had a, had a storage area for each tool to save things in a way that uh, they would they would be uh, dealt with better. But yeah, this is way beyond the scope of the chair. Yeah, I think that actually goes into a little bit of the other. Um, yeah, chair exactly. That was it in does. the list, I think. Exactly. The, yes, it does about um, attachments. So um, we have about twelve minutes left. We can take a quick look at that. I think that was. Is someone going to mark that as as reviewed and and agreed upon? Yeah, if Charles, if you're in there, um, if you want to mark it, or oh, I can do it after the call. I'm not logged in, so. Okay, um, I'll do it right after the call. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's look at the assignment settings one. I was actually in the process of responding to the comment. What do I put? TL reviewed as a yeah. Uh, TL reviewed is in the label up here, yeah. and, then and then also comment. just yeah, add it to the comment. Yeah. That'd be great. Thanks, Tiffany. Cool. Thanks. All right. So this one is about um, the handling of. Let's see, instructor audit log. Each time I change. Oh, this is a little different. Okay. This is about the editing of the question. This isn't about the handling of the content. Tiffany, would yeah, you the, like to summarize this one for us as well? Oh, sure. The, so we've had a number of cases where an instructor um, makes an edit in a test, like, you know, maybe during students' take and um, and then things happen. Uh, or, um, you know, if there's multiple instructors in the site and one of them makes a change and the other one didn't know what change was made, um, I would like there to be some kind of audit log of the instructor's changes uh, that is easy to see from both the instructor, in fact, and, and administrative or, or support uh, perspective so that you know and remember what you have changed if you changed something. Um, you know, so for example, if you change the due date on a test and the student suddenly can't take it and you go back and you say, no, I had the date you know, as whatever, you can at least see that you changed that date and you know, because you're not necessarily gonna remember it's the instructor, right? I mean, I think it would just be good to have this information um, available. and for troubleshooting especially. Kind of like the grade login uh, grade book. Yeah, no, I agree that it's a good idea. Um, did you have any kind of an image? Where are you thinking that this would be? I'm just curious. I was, I was thinking maybe a separate tab in both um, tests and quizzes and assignments, like um, change log or something or edit log. Um, just to sort of list them, kind of like the an events table, um, mm -hmm. sort of similar to the the student um, what's it called event log in tests and quizzes, where you have kind of a timestamp, a change that was made, um, preferably able to be expanded out if it's like settings uh, with a detail. Um, of what settings were changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a couple of suggestions in the chat. Marty is saying something like the site info user audit log, exactly, which is just yeah. kind of a tab with a list. Um, and then Charles is also suggesting that it should be an option in the drop down list for the item. Like, so um, when you go to edit a, a quiz or something, like you would my, select change log that my concern for that is if you delete the quiz or assignment 
where um, are you going to show that? You know, you need the surface also deletion. Yeah. Yeah, because that's probably the most important one, right? Yeah, that's one of the <laughs> top one of the top ones. <laughs> pulling it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's why I was thinking, uh, like a, a separate tab that's kind of like the user audit log or kind of like the the test and quizzes event log, where it just kind of lists in a table the mm -hmm. information, um, and it could be similar to the test and quizzes event log where you have a drop down to choose the particular assignment or quiz in question um, to just see the details about that item or choose an instructor from a drop down to see which instructor made that change if there's multiple uh, instructors and tas on the site right so yeah so marty's mentioning it being an intense interface if a user changed a dozen settings so that's why i was thinking for a settings change have it just be a single line item on save, but then able to sort of expand out like a, a collapsed text where you can expand out more info uh, for the more. exact changes, a show more for the, the yeah. exact changes. Yeah. Or like Could, a, a light box or something. Yeah. Could get a little confusing for an instructor if they create a quiz, delete it, then create another quiz with the same name. Well, no, because in in the um, event log, what it does for students is it lists deleted with those yeah. deleted ones, and it's kind of grayed out. I think the same thing could be done for this. So, Donald, would it? So, I would I would assume it'd be kind of like what Google Docs was it with its version history of where yeah. kind of, okay something happened here. If you want to get a little bit more intense, you can drop down a little bit more. Uh, mm -hmm changes what it would need then is some sort of search field so you can search for an event or a change um, because if there's a thousand changes you don't want to have to go looking for which ta changed this specific setting well that's why i was i was thinking of basing it on the tests and quizzes event log because you can search by user you can sort by user event type uh that kind of thing date mm -hmm. um you know, so there are various sorting and searching methods, and then also having drop downs a drop down per assignment assessment and a drop down per instructor if there are multiple instructors in the site. It's a good idea. Um, one question that I have, and I don't know if we have any devs on the call that would know, is I'm not sure how, how granular the logging is when you make a, a settings change. It is not. Very I granular. didn't think it was. <laughs> that, that's the problem. So, so. so that that would be a new development would be to log the settings changes. So yeah. right now you get a single event, settings were changed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not surfaced anywhere in the UI. Uh, you know, you have to know which instructor of many uh, made the change, search the logs for that user and then find the settings event and associate it with the appropriate assessment ID. So it's it's kind of not so easy for troubleshooting. Right. And that's that's part of it. Uh, largely this came out of um, a um, a number of issues that we had, I guess it was a couple of years ago, uh, where instructors were retracting things while students were taking them and, and doing some weird stuff, and then it resulted in some bugs. So if we went off of how the event log has that search, I just asked that the search field, if you type something in and then hit enter in the keyboard, it actually goes and searches. Because I haven't entered a year for this Yes. Year. But that drives I, me nuts. I always forget to like, oh no, I got to tab over to get that search bar or search button into focus. Yeah, it. that's a problem. That's an accessibility issue we should fix. <laughs> I'm like, it's I'll create a Jira for that because it's really driving me nuts. Yeah, <laughs> I'm having it, it that problem annoying. myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. It now. <laughs> so um, any other thoughts on this feature? Is everyone generally in favor of it? Sounded like it anyway. All right, I'll add a comment uh, to that effect on the JIRA 
uh, right after we wrap up. And, um, and I'll also put the, the TL reviewed label on it. So um, that's about all the time that we have today. Um, our next meeting is going to be November 4th. And we actually have um, the uh, folks from University of Murcia that are going to show us a new feature that they're planning to contribute to Sakai 22. So it won't be in the next version, one version after that, um, since we're already uh, too close for, for 21. It's about uh, a work log tab that they've added in assignments to be able to like track the time that you spend working on something. So they're going to show us um, what they've done with that and, and take questions. So that should be an interesting topic. I hope you guys will join us on November 4th. So um, that's it for today. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And thanks again, Marty, for showing us Moodle. Have a great day, everybody. Yep. Thanks, Wilma. So long.